So clearly, Jim, Chris's favorite episodes are the ones where uh, one of us is gone <laughs> yeah. so that he can talk more. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris look back at the biggest games they talked about in 2016, then name their personal games of the year. Plus, the crew looks back on their favorite episodes from this year, and Doc has some back talk about episode 88. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. <laughs> Happy New Year, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 89 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, Games and New Media with a Splash of Academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, guys. And I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And uh, as I mentioned in our last episode, our uh, New Year tradition is to have a look back at uh, the previous year uh, on our show and you know the games that came out that past year. Uh, so this year, actually, we're taking a slightly different approach. We're actually going to um, go through what we decided is kind of our top 10 games of 2016. And our criteria for that is that we actually... Um, it didn't have to be something that was released in 2016 necessarily. It could be something that we, one of us played for the first time. In basically, if we played it, it's it's eligible for the list. Yeah. And if we talked about it on the podcast <laughs> specifically. So, oh well, that's true too. Um, and so we got, uh, I think, a pretty good list uh, worked out here, and we're going to go through and give each one uh, an achievement. So each of us came up with an achievement for that game. Chief Get. Uh, which, if you've uh, followed our podcast, you know how we feel about achievements. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's such deep irony here. Yes. Uh, so it should be a lot of fun. Uh, in addition to the uh, the top games, we're also going to be talking a little bit about the podcast itself. We're just going to sort of pick our uh, favorite episodes from the year. But before we do that, uh, we've got an opening segment from Doc, Back Talk. This is Back Talk, where someone shares their thoughts on a previous discussion they missed. All right, so um, first of all, I have to say you guys suck because I go away for like one episode and suddenly you're talking about like crazy words that we, <laughs> I mean, actual academic things. And, um, to be fair, it was kind of a, a phrase I made up on the spot. So, uh, Well, yeah, I, I did kind of get that impression. Uh, what, what was the what was the phrase again? Uh, metacontextual player centricity. Oh, I just wanted to hear you say it. I, mean, I actually knew that that was true. <laughs> well, actually, uh, uh, fun fun story about that. That's actually not what I said on the podcast. But no, it isn't. The podcast. It isn't. Yeah, that's um, true. The reason for that is because I didn't, it wasn't just about the puzzle solving element that we were talking about. Right. I think there's a, a broader trend that has to do with games being about the players and a kind of a meta sense, if you see what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily, and like, you know, all games technically are about the players because it's about interaction, but it's the idea that the game is focusing more, it's about, it's more about the player's experience with the game than it is about what's happening in the game. Okay, so uh, before I my back talk, I want to ask a question. Did you guys discover whether or not um, the, the demo for uh, the new Resident Evil is actually going to be the same as the gameplay? Or is it just oh. kind of a, a thought experiment? Do you mean you mean of the actual final game that comes out next yeah, year? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's do, do we still know that actually, yet? that's still open, like, because we really haven't seen what RE7 exactly is going to be like right. just yet. Okay. So the assumption is it is going to be similar, but there are there is, like, a part of the community that is fractured that says, oh, no, no, this was just meant to get buzz for the game. It's actually going to be a lot closer to the other Resident Evil. All right, so then within the context of a complex web of if-then statements, which basically is um, if the player has done this thing, then this will work, and if they haven't done this other thing, this will work, and it, it all has the emergent properties um, within that. I think it's a wonderful and brilliant game design, and basically it allows for someone to have full spoilers on the table, which, hey, it's the internet. That's how we do that. Um, and, and still have a fun game experience because they may or may not fully understand what they've done or what they haven't done and that kind of a thing. You get what I'm saying? It, it's kind of like um, back in the old days, in the in the 90s, we had one right way to play an adventure game. Mm-hmm. And, and you sat around for hours or even days or even weeks trying to crack this one thing. Oh, I didn't put that pixel on that pixel. That's the right 
answer so that I can move forward. And we didn't have the internet to give us the spoilers. So now since we do, what it means is your game state is different than my game state. And in that regard, uh, I think that it's a really clever solution to that problem. So I, I don't think you guys specifically talked about that mm. um, in, in the sense of because we live in such an information-rich uh, spoilery kind of a context, you can have full context of the spoilers and have all the sort of meta knowledge of all the elements and still be playing a different iteration than what I am playing because of the specific choices you made in the order in which you made them. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. I'm, yeah, so I'm I, think that, to, I think that applies. Yeah. And honestly, frankly, that you, you complained a little bit about uh, King's Quest, and I think that one of the reasons why that complaint uh, – was completely valid, and I haven't played it, but it sounded like a piece of crap to me. Um, mm-hmm. but, but one of the reasons is because we're no longer living in that same environment where we um, are willing to take the funnel with the blinders and be led by the nose. And that's what that game sounded like to me. Yeah, no, it, it definitely was. Um, my, my problem with it was less due to linearity and more due to repetitive repetitiveness and the nature of the puzzles yeah specifically talking about um chapter four well i got some things to say about that uh later in this podcast <laughs> uh not about king's quest but about a different game that uh, has actually been very meaningful to me this year and and my thoughts on that may surprise you so stay mm-hmm. tuned and now this week's media topic of discussion All right, so we're going to go and jump right into this thing. Um, the first thing we're going to go ahead and do is uh, talk about our games of the year. Now, we basically went through um, our list of episodes, and we picked um, we picked out the games that we thought were kind of like the best or uh, the most impactful, the ones we ended up talking about a lot, that sort of thing. Um, so before we get to kind of our top ten, uh, we're going to talk about our honorable mentions. Is the term honorable accurate, though? Uh, for most of them, yes. Our dishonorable mentions, mentions are. <laughs> <laughs> worth mentioning. <laughs> worth mentioning. There we go. I like that. Also That's known as the That's games we mentioned on the podcast more than once, and we're kind of like, eh, it shouldn't be on our top Well, 10. sometimes we just mentioned it once, but a lot of times what it came down <laughs> to is we, we each sort of picked out which ones we thought were our top three or so. And then the ones that didn't make that cut were the ones that were honorable mentions. Well, that's so. true. Yeah. So okay. Well, you know, let's let's just dive right in. Let's yeah. go feet first, or so. head first, or uh, some body part. <laughs> honorable mentions number one: Civilization Six. I haven't played it, so uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that was my issue with it too. I didn't have a chance to play it. Number two: Firewatch. Yeah, that, that was that was my addition to the list. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Number three. Gunpoint. Well, we all played that one. We did a we did a round table. We did, we did do a round table on yeah. that one. Yep. So catch that round table episode if you didn't. Uh, good uh, good old uh, Tom Francis. Number four, No Man's Sky. Ah, No Man's Sky. <laughs> uh, that's one that I think made the list because it was such a big topic of discussion for us this year. Well, you know, if we were going to give an achievement to that one, which we're not, <laughs> uh, that achievement would definitely have to be best '60s album cover generator. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, oh, I agree with. I will back that achievement too. Yes, I agree with that 100. percent <laughs> But unfortunately, it did not qualify for an achievement. So mm-hmm. uh, maybe maybe another achievement could be uh, big empty galaxy. <laughs> it's like real life. Uh, okay. That's not funny because it's true. <laughs> Number five, the Resident Evil 7 demo. Okay, so my reasoning, even though it's a demo, it actually it is a complete game in a sense. It's just a very short game. Um, it does have a beginning, middle, and end. I mean, the middle is actually jumbled up in terms of the time because um, you can do things in various orders like we talked about in last week's show. Um, but it had a lot of impact in the gamer community when it was released around um, Halloween of last year. Um, it, got, it generated a lot of buzz, and in fact, it generated more buzz than uh, most of the games on that list hmm. that we have in, in the honorable mentions. Very cool. So that's why I think it's worth including. Number six, Shovel Knight. This is another one that we did a roundtable on. Yeah, we all played that one. Yeah, it was a fun game. If I was going to give um, a label to that as you know, one of the games that, that maybe you haven't played but should play, mm-hmm. that'd probably be it. Yeah. If I had to give an achievement, I'd probably call it um, 
uh, Neo Retro Greatness. Mm. And that is to say that uh, I, I wasn't a huge fan of it just because when I played it, I wasn't really in the mood for uh, Neo Retro. But I think mm. as Neo Retro goes, it's probably one of the best examples out there. Number seven. Super hot. If I had to give this oh, one an achievement, okay. it would be uh, most innovative shooter in years. Number eight, Super Mario Run. This is actually one that all three of us have played. Um, fairly recent release, came out very late in the year. Um, but a solid game. I think it's a good sort of first real effort from Nintendo in the mobile space, if you're not counting me, Tomo. Just putting it on your phone and then hitting the paywall and just, like, uh, uninstalling it count as playing it? It does. Okay. You- yeah, I totally played it. <laughs> there you go. All right, and those are our honorable mentions. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into our uh, top ten games of the year. After that, we're going to go ahead and mention as well our um, our personal game of the year that each of us want to, want to mention. Uh, but we're going to go again in alphabetical order, uh, beginning with number one. And now, Backward Compatible's top ten games of the year. Number one, another Metroid 2 remake. Yes, this was a game that um, I, w- I had been looking forward to for about four years. Um, the development began about 2012, and there was a big question mark about whether um, it would actually be finished before Nintendo sent a uh, cease and desist order. Yeah, I don't know whether uh, not it actually legal. was. They did. They did actually never. They never sent a C and D. By the way, they still have really? it. What happened was a, a DMCA was uh, sent to the webpage. No, that's why the uh, the remake has been officially taken down. But you can still find it. Um, the the developer uh, Milton uh, Guasti, who actually has released his full name now, uh, mm-hmm. originally was just known as Doctor M Six Four, and uh, he um, took it down just to be careful. But he's actually still releasing updates for the game. Achievement unlock. I've given it my everything old is new again achievement for atmosphere, environmental narrative, and boss battles. Oh. So if y'all haven't played it, you're interested in um, a game that is designed similarly to um, Metroid Zero Mission or Super Metroid, but um, also takes a lot of the um, sort of linear gating that Metroid 2 for the Game Boy used and kind of melds those two styles. Um, and then also takes a little bit of um, inspiration from a few you know modern game design tricks. Uh, some from the Castlevania series. I totally recommend it. It's a really fun game. And the first challenge that was not in the original game is figuring out how to download and install it. <laughs> right, and you can you can find it. Uh, so those those that are internet savvy can find <laughs> it. But uh, yes, it's not on the official web page currently. Achievement unlock. A better first impression. Um, it's not one that I've played, but I've also never played uh, the original Metroid 2. Uh, mm. But it's one of those games that I'm really interested in because it sounds like it plays a really big role in the um, the overall story arc of the Metroid oh, series. Yeah. Um, and so if I wanted to go back and play that to experience it, because I already basically know what happens, but um, in the interest of having played through all the games in the series, uh, this sounds like a much better way to go back and play it rather than trying to play it on the original Game Boy. Um, so if I do get around to playing it, that's probably how I will do it. Number two, Doom. Ah, oh, Doom. <laughs> oh, this was a great game. Neither of my two uh, co-hosts have played Doom yet, and I'm very disappointed in them. Yeah, because you uh, haven't loaned us the disc yet. <laughs> I can't buy all the games, Jim. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it next time, actually. It's it's oh, okay. it's really fun. Um, I actually played it on uh, PS4. I know a lot of people played it on PC. Um, it is an excellent FPS, a throwback to the old um, Doom series. Achievement unlock. It gets my rip and tear huge guts achievement for an environment <laughs> and enemy design, soundtrack, and overall intensity. Uh, this game is is known for uh, you. You pop it in if you put it on a high difficulty setting, it will raise your blood pressure, keep you really tense. You get that white knuckle feeling with the controller in your hand, but it is a load of fun, and that music gets you pumping. Boy, that sounds exactly like what I need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not for those with a weak heart. Achievement unlock. Like a train wreck. It's, it's actually a compliment, but basically it's one of those things where, having not played it, I have seen some footage of it, and it's it's very pretty, uh, it's very frantic, very fast-paced, and you can't take your eyes off of it. So, uh, in that sense, I kind of compare it to a trainer. Oh, I see what you did there. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It's also about as gory, so... Oh, well. <laughs> probably even more so. Uh, so, yeah, they get, uh, Doom gets my Like a Train Wreck achievement. Number three, Fallout 4. Oh, oh, me, me, me. Okay, yeah. Um, so, actually, all my achieves um, today have a sort of a road theme. Achievement unlock. Road Warrior Rage 
for Fallout 4, the the Road Warrior obviously being a reference to the post-apocalypse, but the um, obvious violence that is sort of core to the Fallout gameplay uh, being, you know, key in that rage there. Um, But the irony of that is that this is a Fallout that was kind of unlike the other ones. It had, uh, you know, a building Mm -hmm. mode. It had a very different kind of DLC than some of the others had had. Um, And it was, for me, a game that was filled with highs and lows this year. Um, I actually just loved it. I think I called it my game of the year last year. And then uh, abandoned it and never actually finished the main storyline, picking it back up for the DLC because I had the season pass, and then abandoning it all again, um, and then only to pick it up again for Nuka Nuka World, and then abandoning that. And so, um, you know, for, for me... Um, Road Warrior Rage means not just the gameplay itself and the hundreds of hours I spent, but the way I felt every time uh, that I had to, to rage quit this stupid game mm-hmm. uh, just because I felt like it uh, never really took me to closure. Mm. Um, and the truth is, I I wish I'd rage quit it because then that would have been an emotion. I didn't rage quit it. I just kind of forgot about it and quietly abandoned it. Mm-hmm. I have an achievement for it as well, actually. I did not play Fallout 4, but I've seen a lot about it, and I'm a longtime Fallout fan. Achievement unlock. It gets my Where's the Beef achievement for dumbing down the role-playing aspect, and that's why I just couldn't handle it. Yeah. Didn't like what are you talking to do, about? There uh, were four options. Yeah, that's you could I hit don't circle, like con- triangle, those, uh, X, or square. There you go. <laughs> and they're all basically just doing the same thing, but just like put an extra snark on your comment. Yeah, one was sarcasm, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So I just And one was being I'll an a-hole. Get around. <laughs> That's basically right. <laughs> I'll the get around to always going to attack you anyway. But... Yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. It's true. Achievement unlock. Crab battle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Boston of course being known for its crabs. I am actually intrigued by uh, um, by the setting of Boston Fallout 4 and uh, I've not played very much I basically started it and kind of stopped because I didn't find myself that interested at the time uh, but I will get around to it again when I feel like fighting some giant mutated crabs number four Final Fantasy 15. All right, so this is this was mine. Uh, this one came out very late in 2016, uh, kind of just snuck in. Um, but I think it is an incredibly good game. I've talked about it uh, before on the podcast. Uh, by now, I've actually finished uh, the story, and I'm still playing through in-game content. I'm probably going to start a new game plus plus pretty soon. Um, yeah, I hear they did that really well, actually. The new game plus for mm-hmm. FF XV. <laughs> XV, yes. Achievement unlock. Best road trip I've ever been on. Uh, I don't re- usually like road trips, and so uh, as far as road trips go, this one's a lot more fun. Um, but also, I give it this achievement because um, even if there's some presentation issues, some things about the story that I didn't quite like, um, with that I hope we can talk about at some point on possibly a future roundtable, I think what this game did uh, very successfully is give me a love of something that seems to be one of the biggest draws of Final Fantasy from most of its fans. Chocobos. And that, oh, yes, Chocobos. Uh, but also um, the, the exploration and the roaming around the open world, oh, yeah, that. Um, going through all the side quests and grinding, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that element of the game I've, I've actually come to enjoy in Final Fantasy XV, whereas in all the other Final Fantasies I've played, it was kind of just the grind that I had to get through to get to the end. Um, mm-hmm. And so in that sense, I think actually Final Fantasy XV uh, is the best Final Fantasy in terms of like the overall Final Fantasy experience for me. I will echo that to a point, but um, as proof that we did not coordinate these in any way at all. Achievement unlock. Road tripped up. Ah. Because... <laughs> um, you see, the, the problem I had with it is a road trip means you're going from point A to point B, um, buying gas along the way, stopping as needed, having hotel stops, that sort of a thing, not uh, finding yourself 10 hours of gameplay into it at the same exact road stop that you started in because you went in a big circle. Mm. Um, so while I get parts of it is being, oh, yeah, I'm in a car and it's simulating the road trip and look at Prince Noctis sitting on the back of that convertible. <laughs> He's going to fall out and all that. <laughs> there were elements of that that I really felt frustrated by. Mm. For example, probably the easiest was it takes about 10 minutes to drive from one end of the map to the other end and you don't do the driving. 
Uh, you can, mm-hmm. but there's no reason to. Mm-hmm. And when you're going to an important mission, it gives you the option to skip ahead and mm-hmm. basically, you know, fat quick trip or yeah. whatever it is. You well, know, fast any, travel. Any, anywhere you've been before, you can fast travel. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that, that's the problem. You go, you go to you go to a lot of places again and again. And again, especially if doing side missions, honestly, I just got out of the car, sort of abandoned it, got myself a Chocobo, rented it for a couple of weeks, and ran around and did my stuff that way. It was more fun. <laughs> well, there you go. Find your own fun. My road trip was uh, tripped up. Number five, Mad Max. Okay, so this is totally me. Uh, the Achieve I gave Mad Max um, was not Road Warrior Rage, which I gave to Fallout 4. Achievement unlock. Road Rage Warrior. Because I think that the uh, driving around in a car and having car battles and shooting and just being uh, the road warrior uh, was better in this game than it has been in any game ever. Hmm. And that's that's saying a lot. Um, and, and, you know, I used to play some of those car battle games, you, you know, uh, some of the... the, the, the Sort of older ones like the PS1 and PS2 car battle games. Mad Max is great in that regard. You are the road warrior. I loved the setting being the dried up ocean. I thought it was fantastic. But, you know, it was samey. It was the same elements over and over and over again, and that was absolutely true. I talked about it at length this year, so go hit that episode. But the thing is, it was a perfect, what I called, second stre- screen game. As a second screen game, I actually watched the entire series of Grimm on my iPad while playing Mad Max mm. because neither one of them required much thought. <laughs> now, to be fair, that may not be the greatest mark of a television series <laughs> if you can or, you know, game, watch it on your matter. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, if you can watch it on your phone while doing the dishes, it's probably not um, too... Don't try that with the Expanse, by the way. It's, it's, it's a ter- terrible show to do that with. Uh, but but it's fantastic if you're doing nothing else. Achievement unlock. The definition of insanity. Uh, so it's a little bit of a pun on the, oh, the Mad Max thing. Oh, I see what you did but there. You're, you're doing the same thing over and over again, and I don't expecting know if you're a different result. I, I, don't, I don't know if you're expecting a different result, but uh, I, I guess you got what you came for. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's a better achievement. Yeah, you got what you came for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, number six, Overwatch. All right, so this is one that I've played. I've actually sunk a lot of hours into this one, and it's been really interesting to see the uh, um, the evolution of this game over the past year or so since it's come out. It's not quite been a year yet, but it's it's getting close to it. Um, I think we're now in Season 3 of Competitive Mode, uh, which actually wasn't available at the very beginning of the uh, the game when it was first launched. Um, but it's been interesting to see it go through. They've added a couple new characters, a couple new stages. Uh, they've retooled some characters, like a couple of characters have been uh, without totally redesigning them, they've been rethought considerably. So they work now very different than they, than they did at launch. Um, I usually don't like competitive FPSs, online FPSs, uh, but somehow Overwatch manages to uh, keep me coming back. I'm not entirely sure how, uh, which is why it gets my achievement. Achievement unlock. Push the payload. Those of you who uh, play Overwatch, uh, you you might appreciate this. Uh, Several of the maps, your objective is to escort a payload across the map. Uh, And in order to do that quickly, you need to have all your team members uh, in proximity to the payload so that it moves quicker. Uh, If nobody's near the payload, then it doesn't move at all. Uh, You need to make sure there are no opponents around so it can't get stopped. Ah. Um, Mm. So it's a a frustration that a lot of people have, that their uh, their teammates don't help them push the payload. Uh, And that is probably one of the biggest issues with Overwatch, is it can be really awesome if you find yourself with a group of friends or on a really good team. But then, of course, there's all the times that you end up on a really terrible team. Uh, So that's just kind of the... It comes with the territory sort of thing of online shooters. So I get uh, Overwatch gets my Push the Payload Award. Uh, Still a very excellent game, though. Um, Worth checking out if you think you might be interested. Achievement unlock. Not sure what I was expecting, achievement, for (laughs) the biggest drop in... Biggest drop in personal excitement between the trailer and the release of the actual game. Mm. The trailer, if y'all remember, was more a kind of vague in terms of what the game exactly how it was going to play. Are you talking about the cinematic trailer? Yeah, well, they were cinematic. Yeah, the cinematic trailer. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I really expected a different sort of experience mm-hmm. from what it ended up being. I'm not really a fan of the like MOBA style shooter. Sure. 
so it just never really hit me. Yeah, no, the trailer that's, I thought was awesome though. Yeah, actually, that's one of the cool things about Overwatch is it has a really neat backstory and world and all this different stuff. Yeah. That is really just kind of context to bring into like the characters. Like you enjoy the characters more because you know what their backstory is, but that doesn't play into the gameplay at all. I'm still actually kind of holding out hope that eventually they're going to come out with a co-op campaign mode. Uh, where you and friends, because there was actually a um, a, uh, a, a brawl that they came out with. It's kind of like the tavern brawl in Hearthstone. Ah, uh, yes. Um, during the Halloween uh, season, they had like their um, a special event where you could basically um, team up with three other players and you just would take on waves of zombies, basically. Um, and so I could see how that might be a little bit of a preview to possible um, single player or co op experiences to come in the future. So fingers crossed. Number seven, Pokemon Go. Right. Achievement unlock. This one gets my Road Hazard Award <laughs> because of the number of people who wandered aimlessly out into a road, uh, literally. Uh, but I don't know. Pokemon Go is always going to have a special place in my heart because it launched while I was in Oxford um, doing some classwork. And so I actually had a chance to walk around and play it there in a walking city. Um, you know, that literal medieval walking city. And, <laughs> and, and there's such a difference between, um, you know, the, the, the first Baptist church of so-and-so having a pokey stop and actually being able to go to the Ashmolean Museum of Natural History, which, <laughs> you know, it's like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> uh, which has a pokey stop. And, and, and so I talked a little bit about that in, in one of the podcasts this year. But um, I, I really think that Pokemon... Uh, people were frustrated because they tried to to sort of overreach a little bit. Mm. Um, and in, in that regard, I think um, the, the word hazard is very appropriate, too, from a game design standpoint, mm. um, because they pulled back on a lot of stuff. But as I sit here in January of 2017, uh, Pokemon Go is a great game, and I feel like it's really what they had intended it to be at launch. Mm-hmm. So if you haven't checked it out in the last six or eight months, um, pick it back up again and give it a try. Achievement unlock. Go outside. <laughs> um, it's a great game to kind of uh, you know get people out of the house a little bit. I remember when it first came out, the uh, the the hype was huge, and you know people were out and just droves. Uh, like I saw a video that someone posted about them going out in L.A. and the uh, the big pier out there uh, was just packed with people playing Pokemon yeah. Go. Um, pale people. <laughs> actually, not pale. not all of them pale. Um, <laughs> well, not in L.A. No, but uh, yeah, it's it's. Basically, Pokemon Go for me has not been something I've been playing super seriously. I basically will uh, pop on. I'm fortunate now that my new apartment actually has enough Pokemon that I can um, catch one or two without having to go anywhere. Oh, okay. Um, but, you know, if I was to go outside and go for a walk, uh, I could just turn that on and get a few steps in with my eggs. And so, while I'm not playing Pokemon Go as competitively as some people, uh, it's been a nice little thing to have along uh, for when I go outside. Achievement unlock. Pokemon Go gets my page full of Rotata's achievement. <laughs> being an, I, I don't get that at all. Yeah, oh. For being an enjoyable, if pointless, diversion. <laughs> there you oh, go. Well. Yeah. I could have said page full of Pidgeys as well. That yeah, would have worked just as equally. Yeah. Uh, Before I get into those dose. But you know, if you trade all those in, you can evolve one of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, just, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Number eight. Steins Gate. All right, so uh, I'm the only one who's played this, but uh, I talked about it on a previous podcast. Uh, yeah, I thought we were just doing video games. <laughs> it is a video game. Oh, oh. Uh, it is a visual novel. Uh, so, um, you know, not as gamey as some of the other games that are on this list, but um, I found that I really, really enjoyed the story. Um, I, I haven't played a ton of visual novels before, unless you count things like Phoenix Wright, for example, uh, which some people do. Um, But as an introduction to the visual novel genre, I think this is probably uh, the best I could have gotten. I really found that the um, the story was interesting and moving. Um, I genuinely enjoyed it as a story, even more so than just a story in a game. Each of the endings, actually, I thought had a lot of good thought put into it. Um, So each time you sort of go through to get to each of the endings on your way to finishing the whole game out, Mm -hmm. um, each one is actually quite enjoyable. Um, So I definitely recommend Steins Gate if you think you might be interested at all in the uh, visual novel uh, genre. 
achievement unlock. Nostalgia drive. Nostalgia drive. Oh yeah. Uh, proposed name for the uh, the phone wave name subject to change the time travel device in the in the game. Uh, it gets rejected uh, pretty quickly, um, but I think it's a, it's suitable for this game because I'm going to have a lot of really fond memories of this game. In fact, I'm playing through the sequel right now. I'll be reporting back on that fairly soon. Ooh. But it is now a, a very very nostalgic game for me, and so I think nostalgia drive is quite fitting. Achievement unlocked. Yeah, for me, I'm going to have to give it the uh, bananas in the microwave achievement. <laughs> <laughs> the gel bananas achievement. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Number nine, The Witcher 3. Oh, we all have something to say about oh, Witcher 3. Hell yeah. <laughs> we better um, not let Jim go I'll first because he'll talk yeah, about I'll, it. Yeah, <laughs> I'll say a little bit. Um, so The Witcher 3, the original full game, didn't actually come out this year, but I played it for the first time this year. Um, and... Right. I, I honestly I was wondering what I was missing. Because I didn't know what I was missing because it's it's this huge game. It's got a ton of content. It ha- it's in this you know real living breathing world that you can explore. It's kind true. of this dark twisted take on the traditional fantasy uh, genre, and um, it's and of course the storytelling I think is one of the things that drew me to it so strongly because it has such. Um, you know, rich storytelling between all of the you know all the side characters. Obviously, Geralt and his main quest. But um, it just feels like the whole, the whole land itself is just so rich and full of story. Um, for me, oh, and I should also mention uh, Blood and Wine as well, the expansion that came out this year, which I also thought was excellent, um, added a whole new dimension uh, to the game. And it was one of those things where I didn't even know that game companies still made expansions. I thought they just did DLC now. Um, this felt like a true expansion. It was a whole other like, 25-hour experience. It's, it's huge. Um, in a whole new land, whole new place, um, you know, whole new story. So it's 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 worth checking out too. Achievement unlock. Uh, for me, it gets my um, death is beautiful achievement for excellence in graphics, level design, and narrative. Ooh. Achievement unlock. On my to do list, uh, I own the game. I've played about maybe an hour of it um i was definitely intrigued i just didn't find myself at the time in the mood for a uh, a sprawling open world fantasy game um but i'm definitely uh, very interested in it you guys have a lot of good things to say about it so i definitely have faith that i will enjoy it when i do get around to it i just haven't had the chance yet so when i get down to final fantasy 15 maybe i'll give this one a go so jim do we need to excommunicate him take away his uh, gamer card and i think so because yeah. <laughs> i mean one does not simply play an hour of witcher 3 <laughs> Achievement unlock. Why don't we do it in the road? <laughs> and that has a double meaning. The first, of course, being a Beatles reference. Um, you know, John Lennon said that was Paul's very best song. Um, he may have been joking <laughs> because it literally has just the one lyric over and over and over and over and over. Uh, but uh, no, the you, we you know we talked about um, road tripping and, and running around on a chocobo. Well, I mean, Geralt's got his horse and. Um, a lot of what you do, most of what you do, is, is running around on a horse, and I felt very effective. I felt like a knight in questing and all of that stuff. I mean, he's not a knight, but it, I really, I really felt that whole um, everything you do is meaningful on the road kind of a thing. And he never stays in one place long enough. And every town he comes into, like, oh, it's a Witcher, and that never gets old. And so, in that sense, <laughs> the road is super powerful, and 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 you know everything he does is in the road. Uh, but it's also kind of a, a sly tongue in cheek reference to the sexual content of mm. Witcher Three, <laughs> which is uh, pretty much unavoidable uh, in some sense. Now you can you can go on um, full. Uh, Full, full, full nudity mode, shall we say, and enjoy the uh, the brothels and that sort of a thing. Or you can simply um, turn down the various ladies and and go on about your business. But um, it's not a game for kids, and I've said that before. Um, and the fact that it's not a game for kids, and that you can make those decisions and that they are meaningful within the context of what you're doing and the consequences are meaningful too uh, because basically you you have relationships and they look at you and they go uh, sorry you have not been faithful you've not been loyal I mean it happens it's it's really yeah. kind of cool oh yeah um, so in that regard I think that it's wonderful it's a wonderful thing to teach you can't just um, you know have the right conversation and it leads to uh, you know 
blue sex with the alien. Yeah, it's not. It's not Mass Effect. No, it's not. It's not Ass Effect. I mean, Mass Effect. Yeah. So in that regard, um, I, I really think that uh, The Witcher is worthy of rich storytelling, um, and that's why I gave it the uh, "Why don't we do it in the road?" Achieve. Number ten, The Witness. Ah, The Witness. You know, it's funny. Um, in the context of my uh, road theme, I'm going to give this one uh, an achieve that does not have the word road in it, but it, it, it hearkens to it. Achievement unlock. U-turn. Because what I learned about the witness was whatever it is that you're doing right now, if you don't know how to do it, turn around and go somewhere else. Hmm. And somewhere else is the missing clue, that vocabulary, that's going to teach you how to solve that particular puzzle. Now, what's interesting is every single puzzle in The Witness is fundamentally the same. It's a line puzzle. It's a maze, essentially. And yet, they play with mazes in every way, every possible way, so that by the time you are done with the thing, you've done hundreds of different types of of mazes, not just thousands of mazes, and learned that vocabulary where you're, you're instantly going, oh, it's a black dot. I know exactly what I need to do here. Hmm. Um, and some of them are in, th- in three dimensions and wrapped around pillars and poles. Others are hedge mazes, and you're going through them in, you know, in, in first person. Some of them you're just looking at a palette at your feet. But the thing about the witness is um, if you really enjoy stopping in a game and thinking um, and slowly moving through that space. This is a game you need to check out. But I, it's funny. I read an article uh, this week that said that it was the best game that that particular author wished that they had skipped. Hmm. And I think that that's probably accurate for most people. Uh, it's a beautiful game. It doesn't really have the payoff narratively that some people hoped for at the end, like, say, Mist. Because mm. uh, you remember, Mist had a lot of sort of what is going on here, and at the very end, it's like, oh, oh yeah. I understand now what happened in this mm-hmm. place. You will never find that out about the witness. Whatever it was that happened, you aren't going to know. But I really hope there's a witness, too. Mm. And if there is, I am picking it up on day one. Achievement unlock. Funny you should mention Mist because my achievement was the I liked it better when it was called Mist <laughs> for the witness. <laughs> I've actually I've only seen a few let's plays of it and I've not actually played the game, to be fair. So I'll preface my comment with that. Achievement unlock. Can I get a witness? I think I need to hear a few more opinions of it. I need to look into it a little bit more to see if it's something I might want to look into. Uh, I am intrigued, in fact, by the uh, the puzzler element of it. So uh, perhaps if I ever find myself in the mood, uh, this will be one I'll pick up. But uh, for the time being, I am uh, undecided. And those are our top ten games of the year. So it's time to move on then to each of our uh, personal um, game of the year picks. Woo! So let's go ahead and start with Jim. Jim's game of the year. Doom. Honestly, it's a pretty close call. Um, because, you know, I've, I've played some great games, and I I certainly love The Witcher 3, but I think I'm going to have to go with Doom. Uh, oh, my reasoning no is Sky? just... Oh. <laughs> no. Uh, Millie, my reasoning is just because I... The, the intensity and just, like, the, the, the tension that I felt playing Doom, uh, the new Doom, it took me back to my days of playing the original Doom. And so it, it not only is it a great game, but it also... Um, really tapped into this old feeling of playing an FPS that I really haven't experienced really since probably the the mid nineties. So that's wow. that's why it has that to get, take claim. my own. That is that's that makes me want to play it. You know? <laughs> and plus, it's hey, the soundtrack's also awesome. Sometimes I'll just sit there and listen to the soundtrack at my desk, not even playing the game. So. Yeah. Hey, I dated a girl because she was into Doom. <laughs> I did. The, that's, the original. Yes, that's, that's not a bad reason at all. In fact, that's a great reason. This was before <laughs> I met my wife. <laughs> Dog's Game of the Year. Mad Max. All right. Well, my Game of the Year is a kind of a surprise. It's Mad Max. Um, for, for very strange reasons. Um, you know, there wasn't much substance to Mad Max, but what was there really met a need for me. It was the one game that I finished all the way through. It's the one game that I was obsessed with while I was playing. And it's the one game that I never felt like there was anything in it that shouldn't have been in it. I wanted there to be more in it that wasn't. And so in that regard, it narrowly 
beats out Witcher because Witcher fizzled for me after the first story arc. Mm. I want to get back in and I want to play some more, but it basically it got sidelined and bumped by a couple of other little things that never happened with Mad Max. Hmm. So I got to give it to Mad Max. Chris's game of the year. Final Fantasy 15. I was very torn uh, between uh, this and Steins Gate because uh, I really, really love Steins Gate. Uh, but it's Final Fantasy 15. I think it is my favorite Final Fantasy now, or at least my favorite uh, main series Final Fantasy, for the reasons I've got I've already outlined. Um, the soundtrack is excellent. That is actually good enough that went and bought the soundtrack off of iTunes hmm. so I can listen to it. The graphics are amazing. Um, the gameplay I find to be really fun, and it uh, you know it hasn't gotten old for me, even though I'm in the point now where the end game is kind of just like running through the same challenge dungeons uh, with basically the same layout uh, over and over again. Um, I'm going to check out that new game plus soon. It narrowly edges out Steins Gate because it's more a game than Steins Gate is. Um, it's something that... <laughs> in the sense uh, that it is actually a game. I, I guess wondering. you could put it that way if you wish to. <laughs> uh, but um, over the over the holiday break, where I had a week off from work, uh, I managed to binge that thing for about sixty hours or so, which is something that I've not done <laughs> in years. Wow, so. that is like high school. Yeah, <laughs> I, I gotta ask though, mm. did you purchase the Final Fantasy One soundtrack? In game, I did so that you could have it as writing music in game. I, I own it in game, but I don't really listen to it in game. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, anyway. you can actually do that? Because now, yeah, now I'm actually yeah. intrigued. Okay. Yeah. Uh, actually, you can get most of the game soundtracks. Um, they call it like Memories of FF1 or FF2 or whatever the case might be. And while you're driving around in your car, you can uh, play and pause and shuffle and all this different stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah we, I, I, I'm not going to do it today, but um, I, I think next time mm. I want to do a uh, button mosh on the in-game arcade game that you can play. Oh, just I have literally, yeah, <laughs> Justice I have, Monsters. Uh, Justice Monsters. I have literally played three or four hours of Justice <laughs> Monsters, and I almost beat the thing, and I got so mad when I died. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a great little mini game. Cool. cool. I want it. I want it released separately. <laughs> Maybe a mobile app. Yeah, seriously, I really do. Cool. All right. So those are our games of the year, and uh, we're going to go and move on then to the uh, last major segment here in our uh, year in review, which is more focused on the podcast itself. And now, Backward Compatible Crew selects their favorite episodes of the year. Each of us have nominated uh, three episodes that are kind of our personal favorite episodes uh, for various reasons, and then we're going to pick out our favorite episode of the year. So uh, let's go ahead and get started again with Jim. Uh, Jim, tell us what your uh, top three episodes were and give us a little bit of, about each one. Okay. Um, so my top three episodes from this year, and it's you know was a tough choice, obviously, but um, I picked, I'll just go in on uh, chronological order. Jim's nominees are... Episode 65, Lucky's Tale, VR Game Development. I've heard other people complain and raise concerns about the Oculus Rift in the sense of, oh, it might, it, it will make us sick if we play it for a certain length of time, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Is this something that y'all have spent a lot of time sort of researching and figuring out how can we design this game so that a player can can be immersed in this world and play for a you know decent gaming session without getting you know, experiencing vertigo. Yes. Um, th to say that we spent a lot of time researching how to make the game more comfortable would be kind of an understatement. Mm. Uh, literally the better part of half a year went into figuring out how to do it the most comfortable way possible. And we weren't even done then. Uh, once then once we went into proper production, we continued to work on that. Um, that is a question that is going to linger for a very long time, even within our own studio, because... What we made is incredibly comfortable. Mm -hmm. a, 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 a minuscule number of people have reported sickness. Really? I picked episode 65. That was um, the Lucky's Tale VR game development episode. That's that where we had um, yeah. Phil Johnson came in, and it became almost an um, interview kind of thing where we kind of asked him a lot of questions about VR, um, asked him about developing Lucky's Tale. Um, I thought it was informative and it was very different from a lot of our other episodes and mm -hmm. so it really stu stood out to me yeah and that's why and i included got, it in my top three 
I got, got some really great insights into uh, VR and the challenges of developing for it. And um, that's really inform- it informed me a lot. I learned a lot from that. And it's also something that I've, um, I've shared that knowledge with other people. We talk about VR. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, we mm-hmm. have a, uh, a Vive at my office. And so I tell people a little bit about VR as we're uh, experimenting with that thing. And we have guests that come in and check it out. Um, I've also recommended that podcast uh, episode to m- several people before uh, who are interested in VR, saying, like, hey, if you want to hear more about VR, we had someone who developed for it. Yeah, I was really surprised about his comments uh, having to do with the third person being so natural mm-hmm. in yeah. VR. I didn't expect that. Yeah. So. And, um, on that note, too, that we're now that we're talking about you know achievements for the year, um, that particular episode is our most viewed episode or most listened to episode, I should say. Very cool. Um, so my second nomination. Episode seventy seven is playing a game, a creative act. So what? according to Chris, literally everything is artistic expression because if we're going to talk, if we're, is there anything that does not count as artistic expression then that's what at he's this very, point? Because that seems like what you're getting to. Well, there's also the question of what is art, and you could argue that anything that claims to be art is inherently art yes but only a dumbass would make that argument because that's absurd <laughs> like, really you don't you don't even believe you, even when oh, you said it you're boy. like you're as you say it you know that it's not true well no actually i mean like i've done a lot of thought about this in aesthetic studies and just because someone just, says something is, is something doesn't make it that something that's absurd. it doesn't mean it's good it doesn't mean it's going to be appreciated as art but i would argue that anything that someone sets out and calls it art is art and I completely, and dis- I completely disagree. Well, we're going to have to agree to disagree. <laughs> completely disagree. <laughs> so who are the three voices in chess? How about that? Whoever designed chess, mm-hmm. the systems in chess, mm-hmm. which, is com- which comes from the designer, and then the players. Interesting. See, by that criteria, then, if we're willing to accept that there are three voices in video games and that that is artistic expression or, I don't in think our case, it's creativity. A, but it's not artistic expression because there are three voices. I don't think that's what he's saying. Yeah, that was um, so a good episode. <laughs> I, I thought it was a lot of fun because we had some uh, pretty heated discussion at times, yep. but <laughs> to me it felt like we really kind of tackled just about every angle that we could have for that topic. Yeah, as far as the splash of academia goes, that was probably one of our biggest splashes of the year. Um, <laughs> just because yeah. we, That's true. We, yeah. were, we were talking about it in kind of an academic sense and, uh, you know, got very heated, which happens in academia, debates over definitions no, and it all sort of fun stuff. Oh, uh, <laughs> and um, actually, it's funny, Jim, because I, I did enjoy that conversation. I thought we, we had a good back and forth. Um, but I, uh, my brother, Nick, who has been on the podcast a few times, uh, listened to it, and he uh, he had a hard time listening to it because every time you'd make a point, he just like, no, that's wrong. And so uh, <laughs> yeah. it was it was an interesting experience watching him listen to it. So, uh, yeah, that was definitely a fun episode. Well, Nick is the unheard member of the crew because yeah. he does our music. So, yep. yep. <laughs> yeah, it's a very it, I thought it was a contentious topic, but that's kind of what made it such an interesting episode. Yep. And then my uh, third nomination. Episode 86. Do retro games have value for modern gamers? I want to change the word old. OK. To classic. Classic. And I'm going to say. Do classic? I'm going to change it to a different media, though. Yeah, yeah. Do classic films have value for new viewers? Ah, excellent question. Does does uh, say classic um, art? Like I'm talking fine art, like uh, paintings, mm-hmm. sculpture. Do those have value in a culture? Does uh, classic literature does that have value to new readers? None whatsoever. So I think my answer would be. Um, if you just blanket say, do old games have value? It's like, well, okay, which old game are you talking about? Sure. That's what I think you have to answer. Yeah. So, no, I'm not going to say that, that there's value in going back and playing every single old game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just because it's old, that it somehow has value. Of course not. But at the same, by that same token, there are plenty of older games and, and old games that are classics for one reason or another. Either they're extremely influential, mm-hmm. um, say, like the original Super Mario Brothers, or... Um, they're, they still are. They still present. Um, they still have. Well, fun. I guess you could say they're basically they're still entertaining. Right. And they also could you could potentially learn something from them mm-hmm. that we may not necessarily be doing in, in modern games. And it's the same thing with classic films. Mm-hmm. I picked this one. This is a really recent episode. This is only from uh, what about a month and a half ago? Yep. Or so. Yeah. And I picked this one because this is a topic that is sort of very relevant to me. I play a lot of older games. And we um, got pretty deep into this concept of, you know, what does it mean to go back and play um, retro games and how can you experience these older games? Can you experience experience these old games in the same way that someone did uh, when they were first released? Um, If so, or even if not, what kind of value does it have for you? 
Um, what kind, how can that influence modern games and in what way? Um, so I think we sort of, again, we kind of tackled this from a lot of different angles, but I thought it was a, a good discussion. I think the most interesting thing we did was to genuinely take off the nostalgia goggles mm-hmm. and have a serious talk about some of the flaws of these old games. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that needs to happen more. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right, Doc, what are your nominees? All right, well, you know, we had this really cool string early in the year. Um, episodes 58, 59, 60, and 61 were all pretty amazing back to back to back. But I've chosen 58, 59, and 60 um, as my three favorite episodes. Um, so in no particular order, or I guess rather numerical order, Doc's nominees are Episode 58, Procedural Generation in Games. How truly procedurally generated is that in other words we've got blocks Mm -hmm. in Minecraft and they're one meter by one meter and that's pretty much our resolution right Mm -hmm. what's the resolution of No Man's Sky in the sense of the 15 quintillion worlds so so here's where I get to use computer science term sparse Mm -hmm. Minecraft since 2011 has been sparse itself Mm -hmm. and No Man's Sky is almost absolutely sparse and what sparse means is that the mathematical possibilities for 15 quintillion worlds exist, but until someone goes to visit, it's not actually calculated. Right. So the data will be generated based upon the algorithm from the seed value. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Minecraft is actually a bit more complex, I believe, because it also takes into account the generation of its neighbors. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but for No Man's Sky especially... It exists as a mathematical abstract until someone goes to see it, and only then does it actually make the data. So it truly has 15 quintillion worlds. They're just unrealized until they're visited. Right. Well, there's also the other aspect of it, of how effective or dense that generation is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not just the technical parameters of the generation, but how much of that content you'll experience as interesting new content. Right, yes. Uh, right. That's yeah. the one where we had Isaac Karth and Alex Swaim on, and that one actually became a really important episode for me personally, because the games we talked about in that episode... Um, such as uh, The Witness, which we just talked about, Firewatch, Oxenfree, um, even even Roll for the Galaxy, the board game, all became some of the games that I played uh, a lot and were be very, very similar, seminal for me. Mm-hmm. Um, they sort of changed my opinion on things. Firewatch was in our honorable mentions earlier. Mm-hmm. But that's a game that fundamentally, no matter what you do, doesn't matter. And yet everything you say and everything you do changes your perception of what happens. Hmm. And so in that regard, it really adjusted my thinking in that, um, on how to tell a story in that way. And so that was a really neat way to butt up against the idea of procedural generation in games, which is to actually have a thinking artificial mind try to adjust a story or create a space based on the things that you're doing in a procedural fashion. Those are almost extremes in that regard. This is also one of my favorite episodes. Um, It was great having uh, Isaac and Alex on to talk about procedural generation because they really know their stuff in that that topic and uh, really Mm -hmm. smart guys. They have a a way of thinking about things that it's uh, kind of distinct from the way we tend to talk about stuff on the show. So yeah, very true. Um, it was great having them on. It's kind of like a, a change of pace and to hear the uh, same, same thing as with Phil. You know, I got a, really, a lot of really great insights um, out of that conversation. So good yeah. episode. Episode 59, The Death of Couch Co-op Games. I think there's a deep, deep irony to this, mm. and it's that our TVs are bigger than they've ever been. And um, we use them less. <laughs> yeah, I, well, the the real estate on the TV is finally big enough to be able to play these co-op games meaningfully while sitting on the couch mm-hmm. instead of three feet away yeah, from with the TV. The, with the split screen. So yeah, yes. exactly. There is a recent example of one that came out. Um, the uh, Diablo 3. Oh. Yeah, that's true. That's actually a really good cool I was actually going to talk about that later. Uh, but but Borderlands 2, um, or actually it's not just Borderlands 2, they released Borderlands 2 and the pre-sequel as a PS4 re-release. That they, yeah, they I was going to mention Borderlands. Because Borderlands, Hansen Borderlands um, and is a actually, game that, that is great when yeah. you co-op. And they actually pitched that as, like, we're bringing couch co-op back. The death of the couch co-op, which I think is one of the most heated topics that we discussed this year yeah, maybe maybe not so. <laughs> uh, maybe not something that we came to the most um, accurate conclusions about or maybe we did but it's certainly thing, something that we've had pushback on mm-hmm. um, I know that uh, 
M. Joshua wants to come back and talk about that topic with us. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're we're inviting him to... uh, to, to write a letter and, and, and uh, maybe read it or even come on again and, and do that. But uh, that one was a neat one because it was our first listener-suggested discussion. Yep. And so, you know... They, we want to do more of those, for sure. Yeah, so, you know, uh, hit, hit, hit us up with the uh, with the the email that we can write. Inbox at backward-compatible.com. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, I, I remember that episode uh, fondly as uh, the one where I kind of broke down why I got so angry at Far Cry Primal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was a lot of uh, urination <laughs> yeah. in that I, episode. I thought it was going to be so good at first, and then I was like, no, it just it ruined everything. Yeah, it Jim was, was literally so pissed. Episode 16, Tales from the Borderlands. You know, I talked about um, Firewatch not, not too long ago, about how the story was pretty much mechanically exactly the same no matter what you did. And the dialogue choices that you made don't really affect anything except your perception. This is another great example of this. Um, during the deal that goes bad, it goes mm-hmm. sour, right? Yeah. You're buying time by trying to say all these things. Well, then you rewind time. You're experiencing it again from Fiona's perspective. And you're hearing all those same dialogue choices that you yourself made right. as Reese just a few moments ago. Yeah. Yeah. And it feels so meaningful because... It, it, it canonizes it mm-hmm. in this way that it's like, I recognize that he's saying that because I told him yep. to. Yep. And it, it, it has no real mechanical mm-hmm. um, effect on anything that's happening. Mm-hmm. Nor does it affect the outcome of the story. Right. But what it, what it really does is it just gives you agency in a new kind of a way by reiterating mm-hmm. the thing you said. Right. Hey, you remember when you said this thing? Mm-hmm. Remember when you did this thing? Mm-hmm. And so that... That's brilliant design, I think. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's the way that Telltale, you know, even though their stories ultimately are going to end more or less the same way every time, it's the more you can kind of make it that, like, the little decisions do matter in some way. You know, just some affirmation, some confirmation to the player that, like, yes, we were listening, and yes, it did matter. Yeah, that's a really um, good way to say it. The, the more that happens, the better. And I think the Tales from the Borderlands, more so than a lot of the other stuff they've done, really does do that. Yeah, it does. I think that whole trend during that particular time of the year, which we followed up then with, with 60 and, and Tales of the Borderlands, and Chris and I had that really in-depth discussion. Mm. I don't think we could have had the discussion we had on episode 60 if not for the discussion that we had on episode 58 and 59 mm. that sort of primed us for uh, what we think in an interactive narrative a model at its best would be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, to me... Uh, I think that that little trio was especially um, telling, mm. and, and I think maybe even set us up for the rest of the year and, and things that are to come. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Chris's nominees are Episode 70, Grinding in JRPGs. I was actually thinking about that as you were talking of what is it that made between Final Fantasy XIII and the original Final Fantasy. And I and I, I really would go out on a limb and say that the combat system itself in Final Fantasy XIII is better. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is better than the original Final Fantasy. But I think what makes the original Final Fantasy grinding element more more appealing, mm. um, and this just to me, and this might not be for everyone, but I do think for those that like it, this is why. Um, the whole thing is, is, is a battle of resource management. And it's not just within the battle. Like, within the battle, you have to worry about your HP, mm-hmm. um, how many healing items that you have, and then also your magic, because magic was 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 limited in that game, as mm-hmm. I mentioned before. And so you had to be very careful of, do I want to use magic to beat this battle? Did, you know, if an enemy dies, you, there's no Phoenix down, you have to, you have to leave. You're so think, it's like... You're thinking long term. Right. So, you're, so the whole thing, the, the combat itself, every fight that you have is, is put into this larger perspective mm-hmm. of the, the entire battle in this case if you're in a dun- mainly if you're in a dungeon you're always consider because whole- that's the main part of the game so you're always thinking um what do i need to do to win this battle and use the least resources possible so this was the first episode in our uh, little mini series we did uh, not all in uh, not all in a row but um our repetitive elements in games yeah and um, yeah. this was just me and jim uh i think we had a really good discussion about the idea of grinding and actually i think one of the biggest takeaways for me was the point that you made jim about how in final fantasy one for example um it's not so much about the battle to battle grind as it is about um this long game of resource management and that totally reframed mm-hmm. um 
JRPGs in my mind. Uh, in fact, you know, even playing through Final Fantasy 15, I found a few uh, times when longer dungeons did kind of require me to, uh, you know, stock up beforehand with lots and lots of potions and stuff like that, and then kind of manage those as I was going through, getting to a point where I realized that I wasn't going to be able to make it, so I had to retreat and maybe level up a little bit before I came back. Um, and it was it was a good it was a good sort of technical discussion. You know, I tend to personally prefer the ones that are about narrative and narrative structure, but this was a good one that we kind of dug into the mechanics of games, and so uh, I quite enjoyed that one. Episode seventy six: Movies that feel like video games. And I'll give another kind of a broad example, not a specific one. Um, a lot of the movies to to me feel, uh, that to me feel like games are kung fu films. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I was going to mention some of those oh, too. Yeah. yeah, like Crouching Tiger. Um, almost I, I would levels say, up through um, the film. Oh, Hero. I would, I would one, say I yeah. It, I would yeah. say Hero. Yes, I would argue Crouching Tiger does not. I, no. I like the movie, but I just think that structure is much more dramatic, almost opera, operatic. Um, well, right. that's true. Well, that's what was the one? one Riccio um, is the one I would say. If you ever saw Riccio, I don't know if I've seen Riccio. I'm thinking of. Um, it was, I think, Indonesian. Um, there's this cop that goes and uh, the oh, raid, the raid, yeah, and yes. there was the raid too. Especially the raid too, especially was very much structured like because I mean, it, it had little boss. Like you would, yeah. it's like he would go through parts of it, take out henchmen, mm-hmm. and then fight a boss. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the bosses all had their own like weird themes mm-hmm. to them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that I think that's getting to what I was going to say that is that a few elements. One, a highly competent protagonist. Mm-hmm. Um, even if they start off relatively weak compared to what they will become, um, they are competent enough to be able to overcome challenges and to learn. And by the end of it, they're going to be able to take on the big boss. Mm-hmm. That's the other element: the big boss at the end, and or the the sort of like mini bosses in between, um, or at the very least, kind of obstacles. So here is a challenge. Here's a challenge. Here's a challenge. I think anything that's kind of in the adventure or the action adventure genre mm-hmm. um, could sort of have elements like this, um, because it's all about here is my my quest, my mission for the film, and I'm trying to do A, B, and C to accomplish it. That's a fun topic. Yeah. Uh, kind of a kind of a, a unique topic for us. Um, not something that we talk about too often, but it was kind of an interesting angle because we were able to sort of apply our knowledge of games and our knowledge of storytelling and film and that sort of thing and kind of bring it all together. Um, I'd love to do a follow-up to that particular episode and talk about games that feel like TV series. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that'd be great. There have been some scholars who've talked about how maybe TV is a better model because of the way that it rises and falls with the tensions. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you cannot watch an entire series in one day assuming it's got more than one season um but you can watch one movie Mm -hmm. in an afternoon and so it is is it a better model to say a video game is like that if if you have to 60 80 hours to to -hmm. to finish the the story arc yeah and uh, I, I definitely, I, I personally had fun in this discussion because I was able to sort of apply, um, come, to, come to some realizations about the techniques that different films would use to achieve these different feelings. Uh, and so kind of analyzing the narratives from that perspective was a lot of fun for me. Um, it was also an episode where Doc talked about The Witcher 3. So if you want to hear uh, more of what he has to say about that, that's a good place to go for it. Episode 83, Games and Empathy. And so I would argue very strongly that, yes, video games can help us with our empathy. Mm -hmm. Now, what we do with that Mm -hmm. then becomes... Mm Whether they can create the empathy or whether they can teach empathy, which was you know kind of to the point I was making earlier, a lot of people were asking the question: Can video games teach you empathy? Right. Um, and I think it really, I think it really, the answer probably is no, because it depends a lot on the audience. You know, are they receptive to this stuff? Are they thinking about it? Are they really trying to like? You know, are they just playing through it kind of absentmindedly, or are they actually taking it to heart? So what you're saying is. Um, somebody who somehow uh, the emotionally dead person uh, is playing this game and goes oh wow uh, there's this new idea I've never considered before called empathy mm. and I'm convinced uh, <laughs> that idea is no we can't, we can't yeah, yeah. teach that yeah. but I, I don't even can... think that that's quite what I'm saying either, okay. but you're, you're, you're on the right track though okay. but yeah. uh, but, but, can, you, can you go from being non-empathetic toward a person in a similar situation okay, so the to assumption, being empathetic the assumption is then that empathy is in our vocabulary whenever we begin, um, but maybe we're not necessarily empathizing with an individual um, who struggles because of their race. Mm-hmm. And then after playing that game, uh, we, we say, wow, I really now understand uh, the, the parts of this that I had never considered before, mm-hmm. elements of this I had never considered yeah. before. Mm-hmm. I, it just so happens that I had uh, one episode of these that was just me and Jim and another one that was just me and Doc. Um, this one, I got to talk a little bit about Civ Six. Stock talked about Nuka World. Um, 
the uh, review of Skull Splitter Dice, which was kind of interesting. Oh, yeah, this guy's um, cool. And then, actually, I really enjoyed, too, getting to talk about the role with its system. It was kind of like a little mini Doc and Kruger cast there, yeah, yeah. Uh, where we talked about um, how the system works and that sort of thing. I've actually gone through and um, re-listened to that particular segment recently as I've been working on the final draft for that game uh, to kind of get in my head, to get to the forefront of my mind what it is that makes the system that system. So that's been really good. Uh, and then, of course, the, the meaty discussion was also quite uh, interesting, um, a little bit more philosophical than we tend to do, um, talking about um, things from a kind of a cultural perspective, um, and not just games, kind of like social media and all this other stuff as well. Verily. Uh, so uh, quite an interesting talk, and it was a, it was a good discussion. So that's uh, another one of my nominees. So clearly, Jim... Chris's favorite episodes are the ones where uh, one of us is gone <laughs> yeah. so that he can talk more. Uh, well, these are, these are the episodes where I happen to uh, do my best work, incidentally, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> because we shut up. I, I, yeah, I don't know, I if, that, I don't know yeah. if that's the reason, I get but it. The, the topics also happen to suit no, me, too. Fine. So, yeah. Mm. Anyway, uh, now for our personal uh, episodes of the year. Jim, what you got? Jim's favorite episode of 2016. Episode 86. Do retro games have value for modern gamers? Pac-Man is a cultural artifact, yes. and so is Star Wars. So by the same argument, yes. and I don't even know if I'm making this argument, but, but I'm going to state it, um, it's impossible for someone who is currently 12 to play Pac-Man and have the experience of Pac-Man as it was originally intended right. within the context of an 80s Pac-mania because they're like, yeah, this was cool. I just played it for 10 minutes. I get it now. I'm going to go play new game that just came out. You know what I'm saying? So so this, there is no there's no way for us to bring back the awesomeness that is Pac-Man without having lived it. Without having lived it because no, but you never can... again will Pac-Man be the coolest thing that ever is. Right, but you can still or that currently is. But you can still experience that the game itself. You can still you can still have that experience in, in kind of. But you're right. An it's academic not academic sort of way. Well, and but also in just you can just play it. I mean, you don't have to evaluate it. Mm-hmm. You can literally just play it. I gotta say, I actually kind of went back and forth on them while you were talking too. I'm thinking of changing my mind, but I think I will still go with episode 86. Uh, do retro games have value for modern gamers? All right. Nice. Yeah, that's a great episode. Yep. If you missed that one the first mm-hmm. time. Um, definitely hit that one up. Doc's favorite episode of 2016. Episode 59, The Death of Couch Co-op Games. My cynical theory actually has more to do with um, the demographic. Hmm. I I think that without picking on on a specific age group too much, uh, I think that the use of things like um, texting, Facebook, that kind of a thing, has... uh, kind of given a generation an, an impression that uh, you don't really need to be face-to-face in order to have effective communication and relationships. I can see that. Now, I, I, I honestly think that the, there's an error in judgment there, uh, and I think that um, there's a generation which is now uh, dating later, marrying later, that kind of a thing, and I don't want to get into... To, to, you know, uh, and there are more reasons for that. Yeah, there are. There are. <laughs> there are. And, but but I think that all of this is contributing to one sort of uh, general tendency, which is that uh, the value of sitting next to a person on a couch is diminished, generally diminished. And we can look at lots of different would, factors. Of would that. you say the value has diminished, or would you say the perceived value? The, the perceived value. Okay. The, that's what I meant. Because that's what I would. That's what yeah, I would. Say. Absolutely, yeah. the perceived value. I'm going to have to go with episode 59, The Death of Couch Co-op, but not for any of the reasons I mentioned. Mm. Actually, the reason why it's my favorite episode of the year is because I get to rant a little bit about millennials, <laughs> <laughs> which is something I, I did recently as well on episode 87, which I didn't mention. But um, there's a That's bonus, a good one too, though. It is a very good one, but yeah. there's a bonus compatible on episode 87. If you've missed our bonus compatibles, those are actually uh, things we talked about that weren't necessarily uh, the same tone mm. or, or maybe but, just a little extra. Usually they were just cut for time. Yeah, it was cut for time, whatever yeah. it was. But there's a bonus compatible where, where I, I, I rant and we get a really great response mm-hmm. um, to some of that rant. Uh, all about that idea of what social media is, is, is doing to the uh, younger generation, shall we say, and whether or not it's an addiction, uh, whether or not you should be at the party if you're checking your phone, that sort of a thing. Um, and so I think we, we sort of introduced that topic in 59 and really came back to it hard on 87 uh, with the bonus compatible. But I think 
I think that's a super important element of our culture, and that's really what that episode 59 was about. The death of couch co-op happened, or if it happened at all, mm-hmm. happened because um, we just don't sit next to the couch or next to each other on the couch and play games anymore. Mm-hmm. And I think that that may be literally the most important topic we talked about this year. Chris's favorite episode of 2016, episode 83, Games and Empathy. So do, do games in general currently help or hamper uh, empathy? I think that the answer would probably be, if anything, they probably hamper. Mm-hmm. Um, if only because people are spending time not practicing empathy, sure. if that makes sense. Is that just because the games are not evolved enough? Or is it because we, as a consumer base, are encouraging the development of the certain type of game which would by its nature, be more indulgent and less empathetic. The latter. Okay. I, I think it's definitely the latter. And yeah. I think it's, I, I don't think it's I because, like, you know, I don't think it's the whole thing, like, oh, games make people violent or whatever. Because, no, no, no. I mean, there's still studies that try to show that, like, yes, they tend to, or like they, like in children, children can be, like, more antisocial or less aggressive or more aggressive, right. that sort of thing. But I think that that's more just, like, lifestyle choices Dude, than it is. Call of Duty 18 hours a day, mm-hmm. it's going to have an effect on you. And it's not even because you're shooting people 18 hours a day, it's because you are not engaging with society 18 <laughs> yeah, hours okay. a day. Yeah. <laughs> And so, I mean, it's, it's, it's like sort of take the game out of it. Like how much are you, again, practicing empathy? Right. Because it's a skill. It's something that you have to, like any, any social skill, you have to be out there and you have to be engaging with people in yeah, order to improve it. Absolutely. Personally, I found that this is the one that I went back and I listened to uh, the most times through the course of the year. Um, including, like I said, to re- review that little uh, conversation we had about Roll With It. Uh, but also, I think the meaty discussion, as you were saying, Doc, it's an important one, and uh, we kind of took a, a tough look at it. You know, it wasn't just like, you know, we are a games and new media podcast, so we're all about technology and we're all about that sort of thing, but, um, you know, also taking all that stuff with a grain of salt and kind of looking critically at some things that may or may not have um, positive and negative impacts on our society and on our culture, even just our subculture as gamers. Uh, and so I think it was kind of an important discussion to have, and I think that it was uh, worth listening to. Here, here. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I feel bad that I wasn't able to come in and contribute. It's one of those that I missed. But yeah, that was a good episode. I went back and listened to it, and I, I thought it was really good. And so uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us on this journey. We hope you enjoyed uh, this this past year worth of podcasts. And uh, we definitely want to hear your thoughts, uh, you know, your games of the year. Do you agree, disagree with us and all that? Uh, even your favorite episodes of the year, if there's anything you want to point out to us. Um, before we close, we thought it'd be fun to end with a little bit of reckless speculation. Grab your salt shakers, because it's time for some reckless speculation. Arcs used to engage with rumors, hearsay, and all sorts of crazy theories. Next episode, we're going to be going over our uh, most anticipated games of uh, 2017. It's another tradition of ours. After we do our year in review, we do our look ahead. And so, uh, but we're going to go ahead and recklessly speculate, and we're going to preemptively pick our uh, 2017 game of the year. Uh, before they even come out, before we even play them, we're going to say which game is going to be our uh, 2017 game This is the game stupidest the idea we've ever had. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, so, Jim, what do you think is going to be uh, the 2017 game of the year? Oh, there's so many games I'm looking forward to next year. Um, but even though I'm looking forward to Zelda Breath of the Wild, I'm actually going to go with Red Dead Redemption 2. Mm. because the original Red Dead Redemption is one of still one of my uh, favorite games of all time, and I have a lot of faith in Rockstar. So if this game actually does come out in next year, which, I mean, sorry, this year... That's reckless in and of itself, is to say yeah, that it's yeah. actually it's going to, to come, come out, out in they, they say it's going to come out the, towards the end of the year. <laughs> if, they, if they hit that, if, if it comes out around, like, November, like is what they're uh, suggesting right now, if it does that, um, I can't... I cannot see it not being my game of the year, because... Rockstar. I just have that much faith in Rockstar. Rock on. All right, Doc, you're 2017. You know, I got to say, I actually have a lot of respect for for companies that push their dates. Mm. Because usually what that means is they're not pushing out a product that isn't ready looking at you. Hello, games. (laughs) Um, (laughs) What I really want and hope to be my game of the year is Horizon Zero Dawn. Mm. Because they pushed. Um, So... In that sense, um, it's supposed to come out next month in February, basically about a month from now. Absolutely guarantee that I'm going to get that one in about six weeks or so. Expect (laughs) my review of that game. Um, And I'm hoping that it will be extremely favorable, that I'll spend some time in that game, and that it will not be eclipsed by anything else. Um, 
So yeah, I'm calling it now. Horizon Zero Dawn is my game of the year for 2017. Okay. And uh, I think my uh, preemptive 2017 game of the year is going to be The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Um, going to grab it on the Switch when I the Switch comes out. you need it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. If, you're, if your breath is too wild. Yeah, it is It is pretty wild right okay. now. I had, had a little bit of coffee earlier. Yeah. Uh, but um, <laughs> no, I mean, any Legend of Zelda is uh, something I look forward to. And uh, while uh, Skyward Sword definitely had its flaws, um, I, I I have not lost faith in Zelda by any means, and uh, Breath of the Wild, what I've seen of it, looks really awesome, um, kind of merging some of the better elements I've seen in open world games with some uh, new and improved gameplay for uh, Zelda as a franchise. Um, I think it's going to be really pretty awesome, and I'm really looking forward to playing it. Yeah, when Chris was 12, he asked the Princess Zelda into his heart, so... Um, that's not what? exactly no. how it went. No, that's not how it went? No. Okay. <laughs> I was eight, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all, all kidding aside, uh, thank you one for joining us for episode number 89 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, our 2016 year in review. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible. Number seven, super hot. Number seven, super hot. Number seven, super hot. Number seven, super hot. Super hot. Super hot. It's the most innovative shooter I've played. It's the most innovative shooter in years. <laughs>